Hi, how you going? Welcome to York Street. We hope and pray that this sermon will be encouraging and fulfill your spiritual needs that you have during this season. So grab a cover, your Bible, and a comfy seat, and let's get into it. And I'm Erin Jemison, and it's just an honor to be joining you for a season. I'm just joining for a season. It's like I'm this itinerant person that just jumps into a church for a little while just to help out, to bless, and do what I can uh, to just support you guys and the ministry team. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. And um, it doesn't mean that I'm not available after that, but I just wanted to let you know that it's just an honour just to be jumping in for a little while as, as a minister with you guys. So um, I'm very excited also because Brisbane won the grand final. Just saying, yoo-hoo, go Lions. <laughs> I'm also a Lions supporter and uh, a bushwalker. I've just come back from Three Capes Walk in Tasmania, which was such a blessing. So I haven't been around much, and I will be around more, I promise, after next week, okay? <laughs> so it is just a season. And Tim has invited me just to come up to just share a little bit of myself today. And I'm going to do that through sharing a bit of my story. And we all have story, and um, I hope you can identify with potentially parts of those stories, but just to know that God has a story that he can use you by. And this um, this sermon series, or the Perfectly Imperfect Discipleship, is actually the story. So um, this is what it looks a little bit like for me, because I actually sometimes just stand up here and in places that I know and go, how did I get here? This is an act what I planned and um, I just am surprised by God a lot okay so do you ever do that do you ever wonder how you got to where you were because that wasn't in your plan but it's funny because God has a plan and it's that plan that we seem to see unravel before us we all have a story so before I really met Jesus I was brought up in a loving Catholic home and we went through Catholic school and the Catholic system. It was normal, it was good, and it actually instilled in me some great values. Be that a little controlling, now looking back at that. I was the youngest of six kids and content with my way of life. Life was, as I said, pretty perfect. But I did leave home then and get into life and all that delivers. Um, as a young person, I did walk away, away from that uh, family unit away from that tradition of church not my physical family but church so in that time when I was away and got married my husband then became ill and over a 10-year period we navigated a life of living with cancer part of uh, this navigation for me actually resulted in questioning my faith bargaining with God and wondering if I was actually being punished for walking away from the church and not going to church. I was left searching to fill a spiritual void that was in me now. And I just couldn't fill that void uh, with anything of life and possessions. And even when I did walk back into the church, it just didn't seem right. I then met a family through my kids who invited us to a child dedication. I thought, that's different. That's a baptism, obviously. So I accepted the invitation. It wasn't quite that. So this church was kind of different and, and I was drawn by their friendliness and acceptance of me. And I kept returning. Something was there. I joined a Bible study, which was really out of my comfort zone for anybody who might appreciate that, because I actually didn't read the Bible. The Bible was read to me. So um, I actually didn't know a lot about what, um, what that was about. <laughs> and as I studied the Purpose Driven Life in that small group, um, I actually was sitting in church one day and through the power of the sermon of the lost sheep, I found myself in tears because I had recognised just then through the power of God's word that that lost sheep was me. And through that journey, I then became a follower of Jesus, proclaiming Jesus as my Lord and Saviour and being baptised. And I was just saying it was Evan actually this morning that baptised me. So it was really lovely to have him. And the prayer given was uh, that 
Jeremiah 29, for I know the plans I have, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. So not long after this, I did lose my husband to cancer and had two little kids, five and seven, but that community became my village. They were the village that helped me support and grow those kids and me, and it started the journey to see a hope and a future with Christ in my life. And I really don't know how anybody does it without him. Um, so after this, I do remember going to the Belgrave Heights Convention Centre. Has anybody been to Belgrave Heights and been to the Easter? Yeah, it's so good, isn't it? And they have this mission spot. Do you know the mission spot? You go to the mission spot and then they all pray. Who wants to pray to follow Jesus and be used by God? I actually prayed that prayer and I thought, oh, well, I don't know what's going to come of this, but I'll pray it. So I did. And actually over time, I was asked to join the leadership team at this church and before too long, that became two days, into four, into five, into full-time ministry. In short, I stayed for 10 years. I studied to become a pastor of discipleship, which actually encompassed newcomers, evangelism, small groups, and mission. God stretched and grew me through mentoring from others and support, supervision, and just pressing into God's word. And I never envisaged leaving. That I thought I was there. But like everybody else, uh, life stopped for a little while in our COVID season. But God was just starting to just get a little unsettled and working in me. And not God was getting unsettled, I was getting unsettled. And God started to plant a new thing in my heart which opened my eyes and started this holy unsettling. And it was at this time I actually joined another program called Arrow Leadership. And in this program, we did what was called an integrated mission statement, where we look over the, our life and see the people and the places and the things that influenced us, and then look at it again over the lens of God. What's God doing through my journey? And it was actually quite transformative because it actually spoke into this vision. Because it was through Ezekiel 37 um, in the Valley of the Dry Bones, um, which is, you know, in Isaiah, but I mean in Ezekiel, but it was actually for, um, what am I trying to say? It was actually for, um, anyway, don't worry about it. <laughs> I just lost that. But it's the valley of the dry bones. And it's actually the words of the dry bones and breathing life into spiritual dry places that actually um, spoke to me. And in the integrated mission statement sounded a little like this. All around me I see dryness in people who are seeking material things that provide no satisfaction for their spirit. An absence of community, people without the spirit of God or word of God, captive to a material world and separated by God. Separated from God, sorry. In this season, God is calling me to be his vessel, to breathe new life into the spiritual dry bones. As a relator and promoter, I am a people person and service orientated with the ability to facilitate environments where people gather to explore God. With optimistic enthusiasm and creative innovation, God will use my leadership to create teams and communities that build skills, authentic relationships and opportunities to meet Jesus for spiritual transformation. I will model the spiritual life that God is asking me to lead and embrace practices that enable me to remain balanced. I rely on God as my strength, guide and protector to fill my call, fulfill my call. I will meet him daily to sit in his presence and hear his voice, be that in the mountains, paddocks, rivers, lakes, oceans and quiet places that I love. I dream big and desire to see multiplying communities spiritually alive in Christ because, like me, they were transformed by the love of Jesus and its spread. It, had, it was impactful. And then it just continued. Another verse in Romans, which might come up now if it's there. Romans 10, 14 to 15. But how can we call... Oh, here, actually, if you can put that one, I'll read this version. It's better. 
How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one with whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Who? Who, who, who? That sort of was me going who? Because the harvest was plentiful, but the workers few. And we needed to pray earnestly for more workers. And I feel I was a worker. And I know many things changed for many people in COVID. Um, um, but it was a challenging season and it started to challenge me. For my vision then became clearer to go to people who were a bit like me, like my story. God was using my story to go to country people outside the walls of the church who may never walk into a church. Maybe it's not relevant anymore. Maybe people have walked away like I did. Maybe there's distrust of the institutional church because of the abuse. Or maybe there's just no longer a community there because there is no church they have closed. So I took a leap of faith and resigned and joined Praxis. So Praxis is a Greek word for the Acts Church. And, and basically they train workers and to multiply disciples in communities in the vision that God has given the individual person. I'm now supported Australian missionary church planter with them and they keep me accountable. They cheer me on to the vision that God has laid on my heart. It is a missional organisation, an ever-growing movement of passionate followers of Jesus. And today they work across the world to join God on his disciple-making mission to the world. Praxis has a vision to see an army of workers in this nation gathering people together as God leads in groups, churches and ecclesia to discover Jesus, to bless, to love and to make make disciples that multiply. They are an extension of the church in all its forms. Church on mission. And really these words, as I mentioned before, that's, that's God's vision. It is God's vision because if you look at perfect, the very first word, that's God's creation. It was perfect. It was good. It was very good and God created it. But it was broken by sin and God has a vision to restore it. Just just to restore all his broken and sinful creation into right relationship with him. It speaks of his love, his lordship, his heart for people, and most importantly, setting things right as we align ourselves with the purpose of creation. We must align ourselves with God's vision. When we have a vision like this, it creates passion in us, an ability to prioritise God's purpose above our own. Endurance to keep going when things get difficult, and they really do get difficult. And most of all, maintain a deep love for God to capture his vision. Without a compelling heart capturing his vision, the rest is meaningless. God places a vision on our heart and for the part he wants you to play in his vision. Because well, imagine what it looked like. Imperfect people. But he uses the next one. Imperfect people. Imagine what it looked like uh, when Jesus left his apostles with the great mission. When he said, authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you to the end of the age. For them, the sense of bewilderment and not knowing the first steps, such an overwhelming vision and mission. All nations, disciples, how on earth are we going to do this? And that's what we do think. And then the spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit filled them and the rest was, as we say, history. Under his guidance, this movement spread through the whole Roman Empire, family after family. It changed lives and changed history. Initially, it was carried um, in the hands of the 
and apostles. But the mission soon was placed in the hands of ordinary people. It was grassroots movement that spread virally and organically. Groups and families transformed by the message and forming communities around what Jesus taught. Under extreme persecution, this movement kept growing. It was countercultural, confronted evil in all its forms, transformed lives, proclaimed love and hope, and cared for the least. It was nothing less than the kingdom Jesus had spoken about and continues today, exploding in the most unlikely places and difficult places. This is what we term a disciple-making movement, and this is what we're still doing today. Disciples taking the message of his extraordinary kingdom to the ends of the earth. He used ordinary, imperfect people and then transformed them with the gospel, sent them out to do the same. No different today. In Australia, did you know the gap between church and community is growing? Sadly, when I was doing an assignment, I sat down with the, the mayor of Ballarat and said to him, if the church in Ballarat today disappeared tomorrow, would anybody know? He had a deep think and he said, yeah, the people in the church would, but nobody else would. And that was particularly sad. And I know we're doing some great things now to change that. So it's really good. Um, but it is just a sad realisation of our world um, and our community. So according to the Church Life Survey, churchgoers are more likely to be female. But I don't know if that's right today out there. <laughs> Older and more educated. And they have been saying, I don't belong. Because only 44% of people identify themselves as religious these days. It's not important. 33 agree religious faith is important in shaping their lives, only 33%. Or I don't trust you, only 39% agree the Christian religion is good for our society. And we're only holding on to four of 10 of our own children in the faith, uh, leaving through the ages of their mid-teens to 30s. There is a lack of knowledge of Jesus and the Christian faith in Australia. Only half of Australians understand Jesus to be a real person who actually lived. But it's not all bad. Four in ten Australians say they are likely to go to church if invited by a close friend or family member. Yet what we have been doing to live and out and share the faith in Australia, in Australian culture, is a little bit different to potentially what it is in other cultures. It's really hard ground in Australia, so we need workers in Australia. And we must remember that the disciples lived in a culture that was broken too. So if you've had an encounter with Jesus and have been changed, believe and engage with the teachings of Jesus, obeying and applying them on this lifelong journey of following Jesus, you are a disciple. You are a disciple. You have a unique story and God has a new, unique plan for you. He will use you as his messenger to make disciples in a very unique way through your story. Because he said, my father is always at work to this very day and I am working too. He is always working. Every day is a new day. And we must partner with him in the work he's doing already. He's working the vision. We are the messengers. So discipleship is actually embedded in the Great Commission, if we pop that up now. And just briefly, we can do this another day, but the start of the Great Commission says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So we must partner with him so we must pray to the father we must be built and our life must be a part of going to the father sitting in his presence praying to the father what is it that what you want me to do pray for the direction pray and let God work in you and therefore go by the power of the Holy Spirit to the people God has laid on your heart and love them Make disciples of all nations, baptising them. This is the discipling. Model Jesus. 
use disciple making methods, discovery Bible studies, self revelation. This is what it is about modeling Jesus and sharing the gospel and teaching them to obey. Obedience. You can read the word forever and a day, but if you don't obey and take it out, nothing will happen. Multiplication comes from obedience. This is a disciple-making movement. We are part of God's big global strategy to play our part to fulfill God's vision and restoration of the kingdom of God. Pray, go, disciple, and multiply. God's perfect vision, using imperfect people to fulfill the vision, discipling people on a lifelong journey, following Jesus and making his name known. So this is basically what I do in my world for the last 12 months, sharing the vision with those who want to partner in prayer and support for the vision God has placed on my heart, going out to the region of Victoria, Western region, as part of a statewide Victorian team to find people who are open and hungry to know Jesus, connecting with them, blessing them and inviting them into a simple form of Bible reading that helps them go on a spiritual journey using the teachings of Jesus. We do this wherever they want to gather, be that cafes, homes, offices, playgrounds or churches. And we encourage people to partner with churches to pray for their vision that God has placed on their heart, training them to make disciples. The great revivals and movement of God all started with prayer, seeking the Father's heart, partnering with him in the work he's already doing. We prayer walk, led by the Spirit, claiming the ground on which we work, looking to see what God is doing in these communities, the needs, looking for what we call people of peace, those people who are open and hungry to go to know Jesus, to have just spiritual conversations, to love people, moving people through casual, meaningful, spiritual conversations that lead to a conversation about Jesus. We teach people to be disciples. Personally, God has led me to leaders who want to multiply, basically, in towns like Apollo Bay, Camperdown, Pomona, Bunyong, Ballarat. And new things open all the time. Who would have thought that would, God would lead me into aged care facilities? I didn't predict that one at the time, but the harvest field in there is great. Um, people a little bit closer to eternity and open to spiritual things. Many have been displaced from their churches and their communities and even are reassessing faith. I apologise for running out of time and she just said, lunch can wait. This is much better food. What a blessing. And then another lady who felt she could, uh, came to me wanting to know what to do in a particular situation. And I just said to her, have you prayed about it? And she said, oh, no, no, I can't pray. I said, why can't you pray? And she said, because I've actually walked away from my church. I haven't been able to go. So God will not be pleased with me. So I cannot pray to God anymore. Ah, we had a conversation, a spiritual conversation. And I said, hey, let's just pray together. And you pray about that situation. I came back the next week and I said, how did you go? She said, I prayed and gosh, that situation, that's all good now. And it is such a blessing. Who would have thought? So it can be discouraging at times. And sometimes you have to go slow to go fast. And But we can no longer just sit in the pews. Let's grow in the pews in our relationship with Jesus and go and be Jesus in our communities. A disciple is not one who sits in the pews but goes and is used by God, crafted into God's love to give away that love and to share the faith, hope and love of Jesus Christ to others. But be encouraged because God is doing a new thing in Australia. We may not see them in churches but people are spiritually open maybe just not finding or finding spirituality in all the wrong places. If you think of place, places, places overseas like northern India, uh, where there was really, they were just hard, hard places, we are actually now seeing movement exploding in North Africa and places like Somalia, where over 20,000 churches are emerging, and it will happen in Australia. So if we look to tend to 
It's hard ground, but we must pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out his workers to Australia, to our places. I'm still a minister of Churches of Christ and bring my experiences and gifts and whatever God has been breeding in me um, for the past 10 years to other places as well. And I love being here because I want to, I have a heart for discipleship and I just have a heart to help out churches as well because we all need to be united in Christ Jesus. We are brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus and we are blessed to be a blessing and we've got to unite because we are on, our Christianity is on the down low so we've got to all unite so that we can actually transform a world that very much needs Jesus. So this is my story, but you too have a story. And God wants to use your story of, of life and transformation to interact with other people. And I love the Southern Cross guys, what you're doing, because you'll be able to have, you know, just loving, loving on these people. It's so good in Australia. So... You have a group and you have a story. And I'm going to invite Jared up if that's okay, Jared. I just, um, I just want to just try right now just to you to close your eyes. Just close your eyes because God has given you a story and it's a fantastic story. And I wanted you to just sit and I just want you to thank God for your story. Look over your past Look over the people, the places, the things, the hard things, the joyous things that God has been in moulding you to where you are at the moment. Think about the moment that you met Jesus. Think about the transformation that you had. Maybe you came from a really hard place. Maybe you just came from a great place and you'd met Jesus and the joy of the Lord is just continuing on and on. But we know God moulds us in all different ways. We know we are moulded from the hard things. We are moulded for the things that have caused sadness. We are moulded for the joyful things in life in a story that God wants to use you to take his message to the world. There are people on your hearts right now who don't know Jesus. Let's just think of those people right now and how the faith, hope and love of Jesus Christ can make a difference in their life. Oh God, we pray the Holy Spirit goes before us and softens the hearts of these people to enable us to share our story just to share our experience, to share what we've been through and how it's just made a difference to have Christ on our side, to have him cheering for us and having a faith that we can press in and God continues to mould us and then use us to speak into other people's lives, to show the love of Jesus and how that love of Jesus that we experience can be theirs and that we have a salvation story and to know that in the perfect world that God's created, we will meet him there again and we will meet you there again. This is your story and God will use it. The imperfect you that has been crafted into God's love to be used to have other people come to know him. And the story isn't over. The story isn't over. God will continue to do things. He will continue to mould you and he will continue to press in. So your story becomes a continuum, a continuum until the day when you are raised to glory. Thank you, Jesus, for this time. Thank you, Jesus, that we know you. Thank you for the love that you gave to us. Thank you for dying on the cross for us. And thank you for the story that you've written on our hearts to be used by you in Jesus' name. Thanks for watching this sermon. We hope and pray that you were able to receive something from God during this time. If you are interested in having a look at our sermon-based studies, please visit our website at www.yorkstreet.com.au or check the description below for a link. 
And if you enjoyed the video, please share, like, and subscribe to keep updated. And as you go out, have a blessed and joyous week. God bless. Thank you.